Hello, I'm Pastor Duncan. Welcome to Change the World Church. It's January 22nd, 2023. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for your gift and love and prosperity. And just uh, you're the one who gives endurance. You're the one who has in your hand everything. And we just surrender to your will. And we want to just walk us through the garden tonight. We want to do your will and just your plan is always just incredible and the best and perfect. Let us understand and do it. Do you me pray? Amen. Amen. Okay, today's sermon is Matthew 24. Let's read. Jesus came from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to, to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And that word for coming, as we looked at before, is actually coming and going. So coming and going. So the title of today's sermon, Matthew 24, be prepared at all times for the end times, exclamation point, dash, which is now and coming. Matthew 24, be prepared at all times for the end times, exclamation point, dash, which is now and coming. So that could be the title that's, that's the title to today. Matthew 24 goes right into Matthew 25. That, everything's actually connected to Scripture. Genesis to Revelation. All Scripture. The Logos, the Word of God, which is Christ. It's it's the living, breathing Word of God. Um, and I was, as you'll see, coming into Revelation today and tying it into Matthew 24. Everything we've been studying everything we've been studying this just comes complete it's perseverance and by persevering emptying of yourself and filling with him that's how you become a pillar of the temple it's not you who's the temple so the only way you can be a pillar in his perfect holy temple house of god which is worthy of god is for him to be filled filled with you and you're out you're you're empty and full of him with him. And the only way that they'll bow down to you, they don't bow down to you, do they? The only person they bow down to is Christ, who is King and Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the Lord God and the Holy Spirit is, is the Trinity. Um, so the only way that could possibly happen is for you to be empty. And then we're going to see today, it is just full of your part of it, how can you be water spit out of his mouth unless you're in God? I realize today. The cold water is cold. It, he, and it's not that he wants you to be hot or cold. Everyone says that when I was talking to these uh, guys yesterday that were assisting us. Or today, actually. No, yesterday. Same guys. So he said... Um, I said, he doesn't want you to be lukewarm. You got to be hot. And they're like, yeah, you got to be hot. He wants you to be hot or cold. Everyone says that. I was praying about that. that he does not want you to be cold. He wants everyone hot, period. And no lukewarm. That's the point. But he certainly, he doesn't want you to be hot or cold. He only wants you to be hot because he wants who? Everyone. everyone. Pas. Pas pulos. You know, it's constantly like he wants everyone. He wants everyone, therefore he wants everyone hot. If you're cold, he doesn't want that. He hates that. And if you're lukewarm, he, he spits you out of his mouth because he wants you all in, all the time, full on. And the whole scripture today um, is going to basically eliminate or crush the Baptist denomination as an entity because there's no possible way 
There's no possible way that you can be once saved, always saved. That is not in the scripture. It is nowhere in the scripture. The entire scripture you're going to see is just thunders. You're in, you're saved, you're part of it. Hang on, hold on, persevere. Uh, I will remove your crown, meaning you had your crown. Yeah. You're going to, it's just going to, now that we fully understand and we're starting to understand, you're the whole scripture that we went through this already once. The whole scripture is going to jump off the page while tying it into Matthew 24 that just thunders. Empty yourself, fill with him completely, give it all, and persevere to the end. And hold on so that you will uh, not have your name rubbed out of the book of life or so you will not be extinguished. You will not remove you. Or, you know, your name will be written in the book of life. Everything is going to thunder, empty of self, fill with him, persevere to the end. So the only solution is not any sort of theological denomination. The only solution is 100% scripture. That's it. And correct the correct interpretation. We found a huge, huge, we call the black book, is uh, where we write down um, the actual... No kidding, Greek inter uh, Greek interpretation. So we'll need that documented again today um, for that. Okay. So the, the scripture talks about what's going on here. So the the at first he starts off. The disciples were coming out, um, and as there, as Jesus was, he just finished teaching in the temple. So as Jesus is leaving the temple, you know, there's the the columns and uh, similar to. You know Solomon's colonnade of, of that nature. That, but there's you know, there's inner there's holy temple, holy inner courtyard. And then there's you know go out to the outer courtyard, and then there's chambers within it. Um, you know the altar in front of the temple. Uh, you know south, or sorry, west, east is facing. Um, the Kidron Valley and the Mount of Olives and the sun comes up over the east. You got south going toward the old city of David, old city of David, the king's palace and, and on down. There's the original city of David and then it goes on down and now it's got Herod's walls are expanded all the way around. This is north, pools of Bethsaida. And, um, you know, anyway, things like that coming from the north. So this is a high part of the mountain facing the east. But, you know, Jesus has finished teaching, right? And then he's coming out and the disciples meet him and say, look at this place. Look at these walls. I mean, this is magnificent. This is a house of God, you know. Like, or, or just remarking on it going, Lord, you know. I mean, think about the architecture. and These guys have been on the road and, you know, they were fishing in Galilee and, you know, for the most part, you know. So they're, they're, this is just amazing stuff. Disciples came up to him to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Two meanings. What does it mean? And a third, actually. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So let me just point out that they had already spoken and must have been teaching them privately and told them the coming, that he's coming and going. When are you coming and going? Well, he came and he did have coming and goings when? After he um, rose again and ascended, to, yeah, exactly, and ascended um, after 40 days in the right hand of God, and the angels came down. And, what are you doing? The angels announced, I mean, they were there for his, the stone. The stone rolled, by, and, you know, was rolled away by a, a heavenly messenger, just, um, but also, um, there's a clear mark in Revelation 19 we're going to see with the right horse and, and the 
saints coming back and, and, and writing. We're going to see that. So stone, the temple being torn down, two meanings. Yeah, Christ is the temple. He was torn down, killed, murdered, and justly murdered. Crucified, beat, whipped, flat, crummy thorns pressed into his temple, mocked, spit on, slapped, punched, uh, sh shamefully marched, dragged from a garden with the armed guards at night, in, you know, secret meeting at night all the miracles and healing that he did and trying to restore everyone and whether it's get their attention or love or gentle or you know all through love because he wants everyone to be saved but um from turning the or he just healing people you know i mean arms restored people coming back from the dead diseases healed So uh, the other meaning is um, yeah, literally. And let's just pray for a minute. All right, thank you, Lord, and just uh, bless this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So let's look at So here it is. Imagine the, the, the amazing, and the disciples are seeing this going, man, I can't imagine this getting torn down. Obviously, they knew about what period where it did get torn down. Like, what, what society did God use to judge them before and put them into 70 years of exile? Oh, the Babylonians. Babylonians, exactly. So the Assyrians had come, but they didn't conquer Jerusalem. So the cherub and his army got wiped out by the angel. King Hezekiah was spared. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the Babylonians came. And they were in captivity. So who was the, the wise man um, who was the first assist, who really ran the kingdom in, in captivity? Daniel. Yeah, so who came to visit Daniel and give him the future? Christ. Christ came. So Christ came, visited Daniel, and literally told him what would be coming. And so now this is Christ today talking and um, referencing back on some of this and revolution revelation and who is um who is uh i mean who wrote the whole bible and scriptures christ yeah okay so here's this look at this beautiful temple you know you know can you imagine being a part of it and just they're looking around at this and the sun comes up and what happens when the sun comes up it's you know all the gold reflecting and it just must have been, I mean, just an amazing sight. So is this still uh, today? Um, is it what's going on with the temple today? Is that, does it look like that today? What would happen to it? Hmm? Got destroyed, yeah. You guys remember the year about? 70. Yeah, about 80, 70. So, um, so King Nero, or sorry, Emperor Nero was just absolutely insane, burned Christians, went mad, just diabolical. That's another Antichrist figure. He was just absolutely insane and, and terrible toward Christians, just brutal. So, and, um, his tyranny, um, he, in 66, um, wanted to conquer Jerusalem. And so he sent his general, and we'll look at that in a minute, but look at that at the time.
see if I can show you. Vespasian. So General Vespasian was sent and dispatched in, um, but then Nero killed himself in 68. You know, they said that the Rome burned or, and anyway, he, um, after he killed himself, Vespasian went back and was declared emperor. So his son, Vespasian was making great progress, just crushing north and ever getting to work, just cr crushing his way down to Jerusalem and conquering it. And so it fell on his son, Titus, to complete the conquest, which happened in around 70 AD and all the way through 73. They were still doing, um, stomping out like Masada and stuff in 73 AD. Um, but it was completely destroyed. I mean, taken apart, and then they just desecrated the altar, you know, um, just all kinds of things. So this scripture we're going to see today obviously was fulfilled at that time with destruction, physically stones, and then just desecrating the altar. Um, and so have you guys uh, seen, um, ever seen the Arch of Titus and the, where the, um, it symbol, symbolizes where they marched back after the conquest of Rome. And then they have, so after they would make a conquering, they would all come back and have a big parade and then they would build an arch, a victory arch. That's where the victory arch comes from. So they build a victory arch and they would march under the victory arch and parade into the city as the crowd cheered, you know. And so you can actually see these in the capital of the Roman Empire, which was Rome. <laughs> Outstanding. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. So you are not frightened, for those things must take place, and that is not yet the end, the very end, right? For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. I looked that up. It's literally birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. That time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness has increased. Most people's love will grow cold. Does that sound familiar? So... You think that's been going on every generation, including the time of Christ? It was happening, right? Persecution. I mean, look at Jesus and look at his disciples. Persecution then. What about the next generation? The next generation and the next. Yeah, they were just persecution after persecution after persecution. As people were tried and people were treated badly, what happens to most people's faith? They decided to. Their roots are shallow, grow cold, they go into the world. You know, rocky ground, they dry up. A little bit, remember a little bit of uh, adversity comes and what happens to that plant? It dries up. So what do you have to do? Persevere. You have to persevere. You have to clear out the field. You have to dig in. You have to cultivate the field with everything, meaning all just Christ, living water, fertilizer, ground, get the right sun, Get all the worldly choking weeds out. Get rid of everything worldly. You know, use everything for Christ. That whole soil, everything is for that producing fruit for Christ. That's the only way to persevere. That's what the parable means now. I mean, I didn't quite understand that growing up, right? And uh, most Baptists don't. Most Baptists will think, oh, well, you're saved. Or, hey, you never really were saved. That's not what it says. That's being planted in the ground and starting to produce fruit and then getting choked out. That's salvation and dying. Now, which seed did not get a chance to be a seed? But did it get a chance to be a seed? 
Mm-hmm. The seed did get a chance to be a seed. It was a seed. Seed being born and seed being a chance to plant. But played in the road rather than planted in the shallow or planted in the... Now you can say, God, did God throw that seed in the road to be swallowed up by the devil? No. He wants none to perish. So that's impossible. So the seed literally means you heard the word and the seed is there hearing the word of God and, and able to plant. And he explains it even. Those people dismissed it. He even explained the parable, right? They heard the word and dismissed it, right? They heard it. That's what Jesus even explains the parable. And the shallow heard the word and received it with joy. I mean, they literally heard it and received it. How can you um, argue with that? The other ones heard the word, received it, and then got choked out by the world. There's no way around that to interpretation, is there? I mean, there's no other way. It's very clear. It's plain as day. With the Spirit, it's plain as day. How about that? With a pure, empty heart filled with Christ, it's plain as day. I guess that's why it's a parable, right? He who has ears, he always says what? Even in Revelation, he says that, right? Everywhere. So this physically came, came to fruition with Jesus himself being torn down and then built back up in three days, and just as he said. Now, did Jesus just tell his disciples this, or did anybody else know this? How do you know? Because during his trial, they were like he said. Absolutely said, beautiful. Well said. You're going to do great. You still are. So, while they were trying to convict him, they said, he said he was going to tear the temple down and restore in three days, and that keeps coming up. And then, how do we know that, was it common knowledge that he was going to be resurrected? Or was that just kind of a secret thing among his disciples? No, they knew. How? Because, like, the Pharisees said he was going to raise, so that's why they put the seal on the tomb. Yeah, they actually said, hey, if, and if he gets resurrected or body stolen, it's going to be worse. If there's evidence that he was resurrected, it's going to be even worse for us. So he's like, okay, fine. I don't want the riot that that's going to ensue. Post a guard, put a seal, make it as secure as you possibly know how. The mo- In the Roman Empire, who controls everything, brutal, make it as secure as you possibly can. So everyone knew that he was going to be resurrected. Mm-hmm. And how did it happen? How do we know that he was resurrected? The body wasn't stolen. Because it says the angel came and literally rolled the thing away. It says Jesus came up and then he literally appeared and ate with them and performed miracles and taught them and was there for 40 days doing many things and gave them instruction. And then they physically saw him ascended. And the angels came back and said, what are you doing standing around? Let's go, you know. Amazing. So the Romans destroyed the temple around 70 AD. And uh, we talked about who did it and the Titus Arch is still there. To, so how do we know, there is there evidence? It doesn't talk about Titus in the Bible. Herod, yes. Caesar Augustus, does it talk about him on the Bible? <laughs> Very good. So, but we don't have Titus in the Bible. So, do we have human evidence that Titus existed? There's a Titus arch in Rome. You can actually see it. How about that he destroyed the temple? Is there evidence of that? Just historical evidence? I know biblical is our main thing. Obviously, the only thing. Here. So um, here's a picture of literally the Roman soldiers coming in just like a flood. They literally flooded in and overflowed with, and it says even high-ranking captains were overflowing into the holy place where the altar was. And those physical captains just, it just came in like a flood of like 
carnage and war and bodies. And so this shows that overflow when they finally breached the wall and then conquered. We talked about Nero dying. We talked about Vespasian. So here's that beautiful temple, right? In courtyard where Jesus was teaching. These things are going on and when they all these things happen. And then the overflow the conquest. Jesus teaching in the temple. So there he is teaching right there, right before he walks out, you know, in the temple, teaching the people. And then he walks out uh, from there. Amazing. And then went up to the, that's, that's the, then the, there it is. He was killed. And then that's, that's uh, Jerusalem getting crushed and conquered. That's a view from Mount Olives, from the Mount of Olives, some of Jerusalem, so he's up on the Mount of Olives talking about that, and then that's a view from the Mount of Olives of what of what came about. And then today, what temple is there? Yeah, the temple's not there. The temple is literally rubble. Every stone, even today, is just rubble. So what does it mean the temple will be rebuilt? That's Christ, you know. Now, will the temple physically be rebuilt? I have no idea. But I do know this. Christ is the temple, and he's coming back, and he restores all things. So Christ is the temple, you know. People talk about a physical temple being rebuilt. We're talking about Christ as the temple. So how do we know that this, uh, do we have any historical evidence that Titus was there? There's Titus conquering. There's his actual vis his actual victory arch of Titus. So do we have evidence that the, the this came true in scripture? That it was wiped out and they were wiped out in the articles, the sacred article. It doesn't say the Bible, but the sacred articles were carried off from the temple back to Rome. It's actually part of the frieze on the Titus arch that's in Rome today. So you can go look at the frieze, and this is on the frieze in Rome with the holy the holy articles from the from the temple. So physically prepared. In fact, has anybody in this room uh, been there and seen that? Yeah, good. One. Let's see two. Mountain team three. Great. So this is in Italy. Here's the frieze. Off the Victory Arch, you can see all the articles being carried off the pan, you know, that they use trumpets. And there's the temple today. I mean, this is actual pictures to, of this time period today of what's left of the temple down there. There's the temple. There's the temple, the, the rubble of it. They left some of the rubble just to just to show that's today today's rubble there's the uh, victory arch the rubble today these are pictures of the rubble today I mean, there's nothing left it's all i mean there's a wall but not the temple like there's a western wall, but not in the actual temple. There's a guy standing where the temple used to be. This There's no stone. I mean, all the stones are turned over. There's the Victory Arch. Do you guys remember? Here we are. That was right after we saw the arch. So there is the actual runs um, that go all the way down, and the Titus Arch, of course, is way down on the end. Oh, these pictures came in a little bit out of order, I see. All right. Oh, how's that slip in there? 
a little manic picture. <laughs> they're 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 not exactly in order. Yeah. Um, so here is the um, Coliseum, right near the Victory Arch. Yeah, these pictures are. Sorry, the pictures are out of order. So I just um, I just have to come and. Uh, I guess I gotta send them one by one, the future. So this is Jesus up on the Mount of Olives. So I apologize. Uh, we're having we're having to readjust our um, our uh, picture presentation, and then we tried a new method and it kind of scrambled it. So this is Jesus praying up on the Mount of Olives where he was teaching the disciples. I was looking for that one earlier. Okay, so this this may seem a little disjointed from a picture standpoint, but what we can do is press forward and then go back and cover. There may be some more pictures come up later. Therefore, when you see the abominations of the desolation, this is verse 15, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down, get the things out of his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Woe to those who were pregnant and woe to those who were nursing babies in those days. Pray your flight. Not in winter or on Sabbath, that there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be or were cut short. If anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even to those who have trusted, chosen to trust in Christ. The elect is translated chosen to trust in Christ. They're the ones who are currently. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, the vulture will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. The powers of the heavens would be shaken. And then the signs of the Son of Man appeared in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So let's look at Strong's, or I'll, I'll just read it, actually. So look at verse 27. And I'll read the King James Version and go from there. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall so Esomai you see his future tense. Shall, I don't have I'll have it up here in a minute, um, but Osama is future tense. 
um, showing that it will be. For wheresoever there are carcasses, there the eagles will gather. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, days obviously is physical days, Helios, sun, moon shall not. So adventure behind. So shall is actually adventured upon. If you look down at the um, verse 30, heaven and then shall all the trials are over. Past tense and future tense it covers both. And I'll show you in just a minute. When we come to the um, word of the slides, they're going to be, it may seem a little bit disjointed, but uh, I'm going to show you a part of that. The part about um, the abomination. Let's go back to that verse. Matthew 24. Verse 15. Verse 15. The there you go. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, okay, so if you look at the 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 King James and other verses says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation. Like fusions. What is it? Um, what do you have? An ASB? Uh, or ESV? I think I might have Okay, what does the ESV say? So when you see the abomination of desolation. So when you see. Okay, what is... Uh, you have an ASB? Um, I just have therefore when you see. What version? Um, I think it's an A. Okay, the NASB. NASB. Okay. What's your what does it say? Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation. When you see. This says, therefore, when you shall see. But if you look at the word, 1492 is Ado. We'll see it in a minute. Pop up. Ado is actually a past tense. So the whole thing has been misinterpreted. It's when you saw, when, when you saw the abomination. So it should read, when you saw the abomination, the desolation spoken of by Daniel. So, and then if you keep going, when you saw the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Flee to the mountains, housetops, clothes. So then you can talk about it at that time 
come to pass or however you want to verbalize it because the event So regarding the, the pictures being out of order and everything else, the Lord said I was going to be under intense attack by exposing this today. So it's going to be, they're trying, obviously, to make mayhem. The pictures are completely shuffled from the way we loaded them, you know, which is from the derivative of the base, shortened. Ah, uh, so they left, there's a word they left out. So except in those days should be shortened. Stay in the holy place, let the reader understand. Those in Judea must flee to the mountains, housetop go down, who are pregnant and nursing. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world. Here we go, 24. Okay, so back to verse 35 to 36. And once we lay this out, we'll be able to roll through the rest of it. Heaven and earth will pass away, it says here, but my words will not pass away. Oh, but of that day and hour, what does your version say? In verse 36. It says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Mine's very similar. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Okay. Day and hour. No one knew, Edo. Again, the word Edo, no one knew, past tense. So no one knew. 1492, Edo, no one knew. Neither man nor the angel of heaven, that's past tense. No one knew the hour that was going to happen. Like, heaven and earth, you know... like of the abomination. And then, so it goes on to say, but in those days, but as in the days of Noah, so it's just like in the days of Noah, so that's also past tense, right? Just in the days of Noah, So shall be, the, and that's future tense, shall be coming, the Son of Man be. 
from those days past, right? There was a flood. They were eating and drinking. Marrying, given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into his ark. And they knew not. See, past tense, right? They knew not the flood came and took them all away. So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, so let's pray and then we'll go. Um, all right, thank you, Lord, and just uh, continue to give us wisdom. And thank you, God, for this time. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Okay, so we got the slides back in order. So here's the destruction. I'm going to just back it up a little bit so we keep the flow. So here's evidence of the destruction of Rome today, and they... They wiped out everything, and then we can see evidence of all the things that went on there. But also, God obviously punished that civilization too, you know, on coming back around on our way to the Colosseum. And there it is, after on the way to seeing Titus's arch right there. So, we talked about this Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. They approached him there and they were um, teaching him. He was teaching the disciples and telling them about this is this is where he's speaking to them in this place where he taught often. And what else happened at the Mount of Olives? That's where he prayed and like, not your will, but my will, this cup be done. That's where he was arrested. That's where Judas knew where to find him. So all this is one of his favorite teaching spots. So here he is teaching them when they're asking him, so what, when will these things take place? So he's looking now over Jerusalem at the temple and teaching the disciples. So this is where he's doing his, all this teaching right now. It's pretty amazing. And there's a picture of the Mount of Olives. I mean, yeah, from looking back east from Jerusalem over the Kidron Valley. This is today. You know, they have these obviously markers today, but that's up, looking up on the mountain up oh, so you can get a feel for uh, kind of what it looks like today. Okay, so Odin, we talk about childbirth. Um, sorry, I was looking earlier for the slides that corresponded as I was, as I was talking. There's literally the word Odin that means pains or childbirth occurring. This eschatology is the study of future. Um, I don't like theological terms, but this one you should know about because it's literally talking about end times or last things, this eschatology. So Daniel 9. Um, so we talk about the prophecy of, or who are they talking about? Let's go ahead and read um, those scripture verses. So we were going to start with Andrew, but let's do uh, Rachel. Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Mountain Team's verses, but it's um, late. You do? Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Oh, okay. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from going out, that from the going out of the word, to restore and build Jerusalem, to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again, with squares and moat but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, 
and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to, and to the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So I looked at the Greek on that more specifically. And it says, basically, very different. It's um, the group of people come in and the words are actually translated overwhelmed like, it says it makes an agreement, you know, what, what it really, what it says is that another you know, translation of that is mighty. So the people come in, mightily come in through those of the covenant and defeat, you know, against the covenant of the people who are from Jerusalem, the, the Israelites. So they come in mightily and just flood in um, mightily overrun the ones of the covenant and then basically insert themselves into the place where there is an abomination on the Sabbath day. And the word for Sabbath can be complete or finished or over or annihilated or the holy day. So all those words, Shabbat. And so they come in and finish it and complete it and end it on a day that should have been the Sabbath day and just overrun it and flood it with unholy things. And this is Christ speaking to Daniel. Christ came um, and did and, at the and went over all these things with with Daniel. All right, let's read Daniel eleven twenty nine through thirty five. Okay, eleven twenty nine. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. But this last time, it will not turn out that way it did before. For the ships of Kittim will come against him. Therefore, he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged, enraged at the holy covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice and they will set up the abomination of desolation. By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who gave insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help and many will join with them in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. So why did God send this tribulation? Um, refine, purge. Yeah. Refine and purge. Pure until so, the end time. Exactly. So anytime you endure, you just, it's, it's refining, redirecting, building you, making you stronger for the next, but also refining you, you know, so, so that you can persevere to the end. But many people's love will, what? Go cold. Go cold. So you make sure you're on the end of the persevering, refining, building, strengthening, or re being redirected for his glory, right? All for his glory. Job 37, 13, right? Um, So who are we talking about there? So if you look earlier, um, all right, let me wait and um, let's let's go on. Uh, Andrew already answered it earlier when we were having a discussion online. But um, let's read Daniel 12, 1 through 4, and then we'll go back to Daniel 8. Twelve one through four. At that time 
shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So that happened both when Christ was crucified on the cross and then rose again, but it also happens when Christ would believe. Well, the end, well, when the end comes, period. When it's all over, that happens, right? At the very end. You know, heaven and earth pass away. Okay, Daniel 8. Let's read Daniel 8. I can read it. Daniel 8. All of 8? Uh-huh. Okay. <clears throat> In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king of the king of vision appeared to me. Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which was in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. So do you remember who was a ram with two horns involving two kingdoms, one a little bit shorter, one a little bit longer? Well, it means Persians. Means Persians. Very good. Very good. Okay, so the Medes Persians are the ram. Okay. Okay. Very good. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward. Oh, sorry. So who did the Medes Persians take out? Medes Persians took out the Greek Babylonians. Babylonians. Because how do we know that? Because Daniel was there for the Babylonians and then the Medes Persians came in. There is the Mede. Esther, Queen Esther, yeah. Good. So he was there for all that during how many years? Were they in captivity? 70. 70. Good. Perfect. Great. Okay. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. Who did? The ram. Okay. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was okay. coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Okay, so you got a goat who's just flying fast, who is super fast, lighter weight armor, um, practiced, like trim their armor down, made it of substances. Well, they could, and they were famous for just being lightning fast. Greeks. Good. And what's the conspicuous one horn? Alexander. Alexander the Greek, right? The Great. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander the Great, is, it, is he called himself? And you go around and see it. lots of Alexandrias here and there, yeah, cities. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. 
But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. Okay, so who won in history between the Greeks and the Medes Persians? The Greeks. And this is well after Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then what happened to the main horn? On the goat. Um, broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So what were those four horns? Four generals. Good, the four generals, they divided the kingdom up. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Good. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. Now, who was the general in charge of or right around Jerusalem and Israel? They kind of fought through that area. All right, keep going. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. So literally, uh, sorry. So literally an antichrist figure where some of the angels fell and joined. Right? And this is, this is, this is one of his lessons under such attack. And um, the past tense of earlier we saw was past tense, the abomination. Okay. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. What does that mean? So, like, equal. Who's the commander of the host? Equal. Christ. Remember the commander of the host in Joshua? Mm -hmm. So, this person, Andrew answered it earlier. Yeah, Antiochus fourth Epiphanes. Epiphanes meaning, Andrew looked this up for me, like equivalent or magnificent of like godlike, like magnificence of God. You know, like it did. God manifest. Yeah, God manifest. Yeah, exactly. Good job, Andrew. Our everyone. And it Andrew. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary sanctuary was thrown down. So what did he do? He literally did that. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. So he did the abomination, did all that. Okay. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? Well, the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Yeah, so that went on for that amount of time, and then they were able to uh, fight back and restore it. Um, so that all happened historically accurate, which is amazing. So we talked about um, the sanctuary, desolation is determined, we talked about that. Confirming the covenant, he, um, we talked about the verbiage on that, being the mighty will go against the covenant and flood in, come in like a flood. So we talked about already the wording on all that. So, verily I say unto you, this generation, past tense. So, this generation shall not pass, but they leave out, ume shall not, um, Paraket is a pericome, go away, like this generation should not go away or pass on. And if you look at G302, whosoever or whatsoever, 
Let's just go to pull up verse 34, Matthew. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 34. Okay, so pass, Pericome, pass. He is hither uh, till and three oh two whatsoever, whosoever all. Tata, these things. Genomai. Come to pass. So if you read that, truly this generation, everyone in this generation, whomsoever, all will know that this thing has passed. So he's saying everyone here in this generation will know that these things have passed. And if you look at earlier, the abomination, it was past tense. So what he's saying is, with me being here and after the crucifixion and resurrection and my teaching, everyone here will know that these things have been completed, just as I said they would be in Daniel. So the abomination would come, the abomination has come, and then everything, this whole generation will understand by my being here, that all that's been fulfilled from the, from the Christ coming. You know, all those things we just read about with Daniel, that a, a Savior would come, Christ, Prince of Peace would come. He being there, fulfilling all those things in Daniel, also is proof positive that all that stuff that Daniel said would come did, did happen. So all the generation understands that all these things have passed. In addition to that, Regarding the temple and abomination, you know, Christ the temple destroyed, came back in three days, but also again, not a stone unturned, and again, abominations occurring with Titus coming in. So the temple again, an altar again, complete abominations. And then Christ will come on the, on the horse, will, will come back. You will see him like lightning coming. Um, and all that will be fulfilled as well. And so all this point is from the flood to that Babylonian capture to Antiochus, uh, call himself Epiphanes IV, being told that he would come and the abomination occurring. And now temp Christ being crucified and resurrected and then the Romans coming and destroying. And then rumors and roars and tribulations ongoing. It has been ongoing previously, now, and to come. All that to say this. Hey, you need to persevere. Don't be surprised that Antichrists are coming. In fact, this one came as an Antichrist in a bomb and, and desecrated the temple. Don't be rumored. Wars came, will come. Tribulations came, will come, continue to come. Um, everything will continue. The generation, this generation, even this generation should understand all this thing has passed and, and was fulfilled. And each generation going forward will understand that. So you need to live and persevere, persevere, and trust in Christ and persevere. Be completely empty of yourself and on your game all the time, full on. And the rest of the chapter is going to be emphasizing that. So the rest of the scripture in Matthew, and then we'll read the Revelation scripture. And all that is going to cement all these things where he's saying, look, these things happened. They're happening now, and they're going to happen, and they're going to continue to happen. And he's going to explain the, the bottom line is, 
And then the whole chapter 25 is going to reiterate this, Matthew 25, that you need to persevere, empty yourself, fill with Christ 100%, dig in, endure, develop in Him, fill with Him, do His will, and persevere to the end. So, it's going to kind of fly now after laying down that groundwork. Pass everyone, whomever, everyone, whomever, in this generation will know. Now and hereafter. So everyone in this generation will know and hereafter know. That's a big difference. Because they're like, oh, when these things will come to pass, that springs into all these four divisions. People have four divisions of theology where they try to interpret this stuff and jam everything. And then you got to jam everything and be part of one group camp or the other. That's, that's not the case. Um, of the actual, what he's saying is nobody's going to pass away in this generation until you understand the completion of things I said in Daniel and then all this other things, just like we said. See, past tense. They didn't know the hour. Just like in the days of Noah, they didn't know the hour. And so therefore, since they didn't know the hour, and you don't know the hour of these things coming that I'm talking about, and the hour of these things right now coming, and these things coming in the future, just like they didn't in the days of Noah, just like they didn't when this abomination occurred, or just like when the Son of Man returns, just like the temple being destroyed and resurrected and the actual physical temple being destroyed, you need to just persevere, empty of self, understand his will, and persevere in Christ at the end. Same thing, we covered these. Okay. So, let's go back. Let's read... Um, the rest of 24 and then let's read the Revelation Scripture and I just want you, if you keep those things in mind that we just talked about as we read through this it's going to thunder and the fact that Christ fulfilled all those things in Daniel and stated what was going to happen and then he's referencing that now and what's coming now right now and what's coming in the future all simultaneously as evidence of emptying of self, receiving him, and persevering in him. And you're going to see how now it ties into Matthew 24 and ties into Revelation. And you keep all that in focus of pursue Christ and all that he talked about simultaneously in Daniel and Matthew and Revelation being future. And how he tied all that in. Oh, you even referencing Noah. All at the same time, then you get, you just know what an almighty heavenly God he is, and that you need to repent, receive him, and persevere in him, empty of self, and just be full of him. That's the only way you can do it. All right, let me just pray one more time. All right, Lord, just uh, be with us as we go through this, and just open our hearts and minds, Lord, that we just bring this home, and just let us flourish and the garden and your spirit and just enjoy the depths of what we're about to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, let's go to let's finish Matthew 24 and then we'll go to Revelation. So, keep just, just soak up this principle, okay? okay? Be ready. Right, what's the title? Prepared at all times. Be prepared at all times for the end times, for the end times which, is now and which is now and coming. So really, that's if you keep that in mind as we read all this, you're, you're, so you've already been fired up about what's going on and all those abominations and tribulations, right? But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. So what happened when Christ was on the cross? 
And this will, again, they even come again. And the stars will fall from the sky. And did they fall from the sky? They did. Mm -hmm. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And were they shaken? They were shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And did he appear after the resurrection? And will he appear again in the sky? So isn't this amazing how he's talking about triple death? Or more than that. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So did they mourn after they felt the pain of his, what they did to him then? But also when he comes back and again takes the scar off. You know the, how you get cemented and scar from sin and can't see because you're so hardened? Like a scar, like burnt. Like a, like a cinder and iron burns you and you have lost your feeling. He's going to remove that at, when he comes back and at Judgment Day. And everyone's going to see it and just be crushed. Like your full sensitivity is going to be restored. That the sin hardens you. And then you're going to mourn because you're going to realize. Everyone's going to realize what a sinner that they are. See the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So they saw that then with the ascension, but they're also going to see it with the great right horse, right? They'll send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together, chosen from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. We're going to read Revelation 19 in a minute. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know summer is near. Are there signs going on right now? Were there signs going on then? Have there been signs all the way through history? And signs after Christ. So those are tender leaves. And right now with all the miracles Christ is doing, is that not the budding of the fig tree? Know that summer is near so that you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Is Christ at the door knocking? Mm -hmm. Always. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. So there it is again. He just said it again. In a different way. They will not, until they understand, until these things actually pass. So every generation understands what has passed and that these things are passing. And these things are happening now and then will be coming. Every generation has comprehension. So he said it again. Heaven and earth will not will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Then he goes to the future. Heaven and earth will pass away, both for you now and overall, because all the old things are gone and taken away, and the new things come, new heaven, new earth, right? And sin, devil, false prophets, uh, death, all get thrown into the lake of fire, and all the sinners too, right? But at that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the sun. They didn't know, they didn't know when the abominations happened in the past. Back then, they didn't know, and they will not know. But the Father alone, for the coming of the Son of Man, will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage. Till that day, Noah entered the ark. So what should they have been doing? On the alert, aware, full on. They did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so it was. And it will be and is at that time. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming, for you now and overall. But be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what time the thief of the night was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed a house to be broken in. So what should we we should always be ready, alert, full on, serving him full on. For this reason, you must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is faithful and the sensible slave 
who the master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. So is that everyone? That's everyone. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, just sin, right? The master of that slave will come on that day when he does not expect, and the hour which he does not know will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, the get sell all, use everything you have for Christ. Everything, every, all your possessions should be utilized for the kingdom, right? You know, obviously there's a holy ten percent, like we talked about last week. But everything is being utilized for the kingdom. If you're using everything for the kingdom, then He puts you in charge of, a, of all the things to be utilized again for His glory. Everything to be utilized for Him, you'll be able to manage stuff for Him fulfilled if it's his purpose and glory that's how it works amazing okay so let's read uh, revelation 2 1 through 7 so i want you to think about this do you want to do that one or mom okay sure revelation 2 1 through 7 yeah okay to the angel of the church in ephesus write the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says, Christ. says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and re will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do not have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Repent so that he won't. And they're already pursuing Christ, right? Because he's complimenting them. They're already in Christ, walking with him. Repent so I don't remove your lampstand, because right now you have a lampstand. And um, if you endure to the end, then you eat of the tree of life. It means heaven. See, you have to endure. Mm -hmm. All right, next. Yes. Okay. Uh, 8 through 11. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Who's that? Christ. Christ. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. So are these Christians? Mm -hmm. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So these are Christians. If they stay faithful to death, then mm -hmm. receive the crown of life. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And the one who conquers, if they conquer, okay. these are Christians. If they conquer, then they will not be hurt by the second death. That's have to persevere. Okay, let's do uh, 12 through 17, chapter 2, Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you Who has a sharp two edged sword? Christ. That's Christ. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. Okay, so faith. They have faith. So these are Christians or non Christians? Christians. Yeah, so they didn't deny the faith. So we're talking to Christians in the church. 
Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because there are some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who keep teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some, in the same way, hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, or else I am coming to you quickly. So repent. So these are Christians fallen into the world. He's telling those Christians to repent. These are people who were saved. And I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So if you overcome, you get the manna, which is the bread of life here, which is Christ, which is heaven, and your name will be written, especially that meaning you're in heaven with your new name in Christ, in the white stone. That's pretty clear. Oh, repent and overcome. These are people. These are people who are saved, who are dabbling in sinful. Okay. Um, eighteen through twenty-nine, Revelation two. And to the church, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Who's that? Son of God. Yeah. And we went through all these churches in depth. You can look back at the sermons and explain why he used different terminology for different cities. Yeah. I know your works, your love and faith, and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. So these are Christians, latter works exceed the first. So these are people who are saved and working for the kingdom. You agree with the verbiage? Mm -hmm. Okay. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So these are sin, sinning happening in Christians. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And so unless they repent, they're going to go into great tribulation and death. So these are Christians that give them a chance to repent. And he's trying to give them tribulation to purify them. And if they don't repent, then they die. These are Christians dying. Okay. Like spiritual, physical, and spiritual death. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not lear learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earth and pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So what do you think about that last part? About the overcoming? you got to persevere, conquer, and overcome. So how can you rule with them? Are you going to rule with the rod of iron? Who's that? Christ. Just Christ. Mm -hmm. So how can you rule if it's just Christ that rules? You have to humble yourself and just have Christ in you. Empty yourself and just Christ, because he's the one. Who's the shattered potter? He's the potter, we're the clay. Mm -hmm. So we're shattered clay. So we shatter ourselves. He's saying, literally, empty yourself. Understand our will. He's going to remold it. You're going to be in him, then you're going to rule, not you. He's ruling because you're empty of self and filled with him, and you're part of, completely part of his temple mm -hmm. and kingdom. 
And if you overcome, then you're in, in the, so you receive the morning star, meaning he is the morning star, meaning fully in Christ is the only way you can be in God if you're fully in Christ. That's amazing. Um, Revelation 3, 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen, strengthen the things that remain. So these are Christians who are alive but dead, on their way to death, and he wants to re rekindle that flame. These are Christians that are saved. Believers. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. Strengthen what remains before it dies. That's a plant who's Christian producing fruit. He wants to strengthen and revitalize before it dies. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not, who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes, thus will be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So to be in heaven, you need white garments, is the soil garments of sin, and you will not um, blot your name out of the book of life, meaning your name's in the book of life and will be blotted out if you don't repent. That's pretty clear. All right, let's do 7 through 13, Revelation 3, please. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia right? The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So who's the key in David, the line of David, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ? I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Okay, if they have an open door, no one can shut. That means they're saved. So they have the open door, they're on the path. Nobody can take it from you. Remember... Uh, Romans 8, you know, life, death, principality. So no one can take it from you, but you can, we'll see, walk away. I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So these are Christians. Kept my word and not denied my name. That's a Christian believer. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. And they will... How is that? Are they going to bow down before their feet? No, you empty yourself and fill Christ. They only bow before Christ. That's another evidence of everything we're saying. To understand his will and to be holy and to empty and utilize everything for Christ so you can manage for him, right? Yeah. And they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word. About patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. How do you get your crown seized? These are believers. What does that mean, seizing your crown? Like, have eternal life taken away. Or... But what does it mean, seize your crown? They take, have eternal life taken from you. Exactly. They take, you have eternal life taken from you. That's what it means. It's pretty clear. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Okay, how can you be a pillar in God? Just temple. Through Christ. Yeah, he is the temple. That's being completely in Christ. See that? Mm -hmm. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. In my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That means heaven. Overcoming. Okay, can we read Revelation 3, 14 through 22? To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, Who's says that? this. Beginning of creation. Yeah, faithful. That's Christ. And Zenon says that his name in, 
in uh, Revelation 19 or in the scripture. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So what does cold mean? It was cold heart. Cold yeah. Cold. So, yeah, cold hearted, you know. Um, and hot means healing hot for Christ. But lukewarm means you have, you're in his mouth. You can't be in his mouth unless you're a Christian believer. That's the only way you can be a part of him in tasting. So the lukewarm are believers. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So how do you sit down on the throne? Only Christ can do that, right? So you have to be empty of self and filled with him. He who overcomes. We'll get the victory. And if you don't, then he'll spit you out, meaning you're out, you're done, you're, there's no part of you. So these are believers. I mean, can, there's no way to misinterpret all seven of those saying the same thing. Can we read Revelation 19? Yeah. This, uh, did you finish? Yes. Okay. Can we go back to the... Oh, do you want to? Okay. Mom, I think Mom wants to. Oh, no. After this, I heard what seemed to be a, the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. So these are the angels announcing him, Hallelujah, you know, we talk about trumpets and everything. And has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So this is the big announcement he just talked about. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, great and small. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt him, and give him glory, give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We just talked about weddings last week. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I love that analogy. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. There it is. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Armies of heaven on white horses following him. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and the riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great and small. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who was in its presence, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So two women will be grinding associated one with the other. So, two women grinding. Take one, and the words connotate one is taken and justified and righteous and forgiven, and the other is cast away. They're separated. It's just clear what the scripture says. All right, thank you, Lord. We love you. And uh, thank you, God, for showing us to be ready and always on all the time and maximizing every minute, depending on self, filling with you and being completely in you and persevering to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.